This is the second half of the lecture on brachial plexus imaging. Let's move on to neoplasms. We're going to talk about primary neoplasms first. Mostly we're dealing with schwannomas, neurofibromas, and malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, which is the blanket term for the malignant version of both schwannomas and neurofibromas. The most common neoplasm that we encounter in the brachial plexus is a schwannoma. And a schwannoma in the brachial plexus looks just like a schwannoma everywhere else. It's going to be bright on T2, and it's going to be heterogeneously enhancing on post-contrast imaging. These tend to be elongated oval uh, objects like they are everywhere. So if it looks like the schwannomas you see everywhere else, but it's in the brachial plexus, it's probably a schwannoma of the brachial plexus. Another example, uh, this time a sagittal T2 and a coronal T1, you can see that it is elongated in the, uh, along the length of the nerve there. Here's a mimic of brachial plexus schwannoma. This is a schwannoma in the base of the neck, but it's not in the brachial plexus, right? This is a uniform T2 weighted, uh, elongated mass in the lower neck looks a lot like a brachial plexus schwannoma but the key here is figuring out what its relationship is to the scalene muscles does this thing run through the scalene triangle the way we would expect for a schwannoma of the brachial plexus well maybe the t1 shows it a little better here is the mass here is the subclavian artery. That is the anterior scalene muscle, and this mass is running anterior to the anterior scalene muscle. The brachial plexus is supposed to be back here between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. Here's our scalene triangle. Here's our subclavian artery. That's where our brachial plexus is supposed to be. This is too far forward. This lesion is elevating the common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein and splaying them away from each other a little bit. It's centered right behind those two vascular structures. That's exactly where we expect the vagal nerve to run. This is a vagal schwannoma trying to fool you into thinking that it is a brachial plexus schwannoma. Neurofibromas can certainly affect the um, brachial plexus. Usually this comes in a clinical context where it's not much of a mystery what's going on. Plexiform neurofibromas can uh, coalesce together, multiple nerve roots coalescing uh, together into a single plexiform neurofibroma as they uh, join together to form the brachial plexus. Uh, a clue, of course, that there are innumerable other uh, plexiform neurofibromas all up and down the nerve roots of the cervical and thoracic spine. So this could be a really confusing mass if you encounter it in the wild, right? It's just a huge mass in a young, healthy woman, and it's really expanding her lower neck. What could be going on here? How are we going to put a differential diagnosis on this? Well, this is a proton density sequence. If you look at this object right here, what is this thing indenting the front of this huge mass? That's the anterior scalene muscle. This is the scalene triangle, this hugely widened area here. That is the scalene triangle. And this mass, this well-defined uniform mass, is running right through the scalene triangle. So by recognizing this as the anterior scalene muscle, and it helps to go up and down on sequential images and, and make sure that it's got the right anatomic uh, orientation, that is the anterior scalene muscle. Now we know that this is running through the scalene triangle, not a lot of things do that. And for an enhancing mass, it's going to be a nerve sheath tumor. Um, I don't think there's anything about this that would allow you to determine that this was a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. It had a fast rate of growth, and that's what sort of clued us in. Uh, but it looks just like a schwannoma of the brachial plexus. Okay, let's talk about secondary neoplasms, malignancies, that can affect the brachial plexus. Lung cancer of the apex famously can invade up through the chest wall into the brachial plexus. We call it a pancoast tumor. Uh, a peripheral uh, peanut, which is really a Ewing sarcoma, um, can affect the, uh, the chest wall there. A variety of other sarcomas and other sarcoma subtypes 
Breast cancer, again, famously axillary nodes because they're right near the brachial plexus, can invade into the brachial plexus. Uh, lymphoma can crawl along nerves or arise in the axilla. And occasionally you'll get a distant metastasis from some random tumor elsewhere in the body that decides it's going to land in an axillary node and, and invade into the brachial plexus. Here's an example of a pancoast tumor, right? This mass here uh, began at the apex of the lung. It's actually a lung cancer. And you can see it's very aggressive, extending into the ribs, into the chest wall, and up into the neck. Here's the anterior scalene muscle somewhere in there, I guess, is the middle scalene muscle. The scalene triangle completely filled in with tumor. You can imagine how that's going to affect the brachial plexus that's supposed to be living right there. Primitive neuroectodermal tumors, uh, we used to think that these were arising from nerve elements here in the upper chest and lower neck, but I, I think that that's no longer considered to be the case. Nevertheless, this looks just like that pancoast tumor, right? Very aggressive from the upper lung into the chest wall and, and up into the uh, scalene triangle. There's our anterior scalene muscle. There's our middle scalene muscle tumor completely filling in the scaling triangle, uh, one could argue that you can still make out the three trunks of the brachial plexus there, but they are not in good shape. Breast cancer is famous for affecting the brachial plexus because it metastasizes to these axillary and supraclavicular lymph nodes that are right near the brachial plexus. So here is a post contrast image. You can see some large nodes, but where is the brachial plexus itself for those things to invade? That's where the unenhanced T1 weighted image is going to come to our rescue. Um, you can see here, there's the subclavian artery. Here are all of the nerves of the brachial plexus, and you can see right where those nerves actually are anatomically. You go back to your post contrast, and you can see, yeah, there's a little abnormal enhancement there. There actually is infiltration of the uh, brachial plexus by this metastatic disease. Another example of breast cancer here, we'll start with the T1 weighted unenhanced image. This is a large lymph node. You can see there are clips from a prior lymphadenectomy, but uh, they missed one. This one has come back as a, an enlarging lymph node, and you can see it right along the expected path of the brachial plexus. Here it is on sagittal post contrast. Once again, uh, some field distortion from the clips, but a large recurrence right along the expected course of the uh, distal brachial plexus. Here we're getting into the, uh, into the cords and branches of the brachial plexus. So what are some of the inflammatory disorders that cause brachial plexopathy? Probably the most common inflammatory disease that we are called upon to assess is radiation fibrosis. This gets back to the situation of patients with breast cancer. Somebody who has received therapeutic radiation for breast cancer then develops arm weakness, and we're not sure whether it is radiation fibrosis or whether it is recurrent tumor, obviously a critical distinction. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, usually doesn't get high enough to affect the brachial plexus, but can. Uh, Miller-Fisher syndrome is like Guillain-Barre in reverse, where it goes from the top to the bottom, usually doesn't get low enough to affect the brachial plexus, but can. Chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, uh, another chronic disease that can cause enlargement of the, uh, of the nerves. And of course, infection, rare, but occasionally we get viral diseases. Let's talk about radiation fibrosis and how we distinguish radiation plexopathy from recurrent tumor. I've chosen this particular slide because it happens to have both tumor and radiation fibrosis on it, so it's nice to show that distinction. Let's look at the T1 weighted sequence here. There is a large mass encasing some of the ribs and eroding through the chest wall, but then there is also a smaller mass here alongside the subclavian artery right there, maybe axillary at this point, right alongside the, ax the axillary artery. One of these is tumor, and one of them is radiation fibrosis. How are we gonna tell them apart? We're gonna look to our T2 weighted images. The larger mass here is heterogeneously bright on T2, just like you'd expect uh, an aggressive tumor to be. The radiation fibrosis, however, is T2 dark. 
right? Tumor T2 bright, radiation T2 dark, because it's mostly fibrous tissue, and we expect that to be dark both on T1 and T2. So if you were to ask me, what is causing a plexopathy in this patient? Well, I know that the brachial plexus is running right along with the artery there. This is the pathology that is along the brachial plexus. This is radiation fibrosis. There is a big recurrent tumor here, but that's not what's affecting the brachial plexus. Okay, another example of radiation fibrosis. We're pretty far out laterally now, and we're into the arm. We are seeing this mass surrounding the axillary artery here. Very concerning appearance. Could this be recurrent tumor? We go to our T2-weighted images, and we see that there is very low signal on T2 in this anatomic area that we've just defined, right? We're using our T1 to tell us where to look. We're using our T2 signal to figure out this area does not have a lot of bright signal. This is radiation fibrosis, not recurrent tumor. Next up, a rare disease, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Uh, in this disease, the nerves, the nerve roots all become thickened and enlarged. And on this T2-weighted sagittal image, you can see every single nerve root in the cervical spine is enlarged. This looks just like neurofibromatosis type 2, where there are schwannomas at every single level, or neurofibromatosis type 1, where there are, uh, is a plexiform neurofibroma forming from all of these nerve roots. Your clinical history is going to be necessary to distinguish those. Here it is extending out into the brachial plexus. You can see marked enlargement of C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 as they coalesce uh, into the brachial plexus right there. Here's the same appearance in the axial plane. Uh, you can see individual nerves that are markedly enlarged. How do I know that this is the brachial plexus and not a bunch of lymph nodes or something like that or vessels? Well, here's my anterior scalene muscle. There's my middle scalene muscle. Here we are running right through the scalene triangle. What runs through the scalene triangle? The brachial plexus. So these are the three trunks of the brachial plexus on each side, markedly enlarged by the patient's inflammatory disease. Infectious brachial plexopathy is a rare entity. Um, you can see here is the anterior scalene muscle here in the scalene triangle. You can see the trunks of the brachial plexus. They're maybe a little bit hazy, maybe a little bit thickened, not really striking on the unenhanced images. But when we move over to the post-contrast images, striking amount of abnormal enhancement and you know right where to look because of those T1 weighted images so you correlate on your post contrast images you find extensive enhancement of the brachial plexus this happens to be uh, VZV uh, infection of the uh, of the brachial plexus in an immunocompromised patient okay the next category of diseases that can cause brachial plexopathy is vascular diseases um, the, the big one that we're looking for here is pseudoaneurysm, uh, an injury to the subclavian artery. Um, uh, venous occlusion, either through thrombosis or through external compression, can also cause a problem for the brachial plexus. Uh, you might not think the venous occlusion would be a big deal for the brachial plexus, but you can get a lot of inflammatory disease, especially if it's uh, a thrombophlebitis, um, but even in the absence of the thrombophlebitis, you can get edema around an occluded vein that can cause brachial plexopathy. So the first example of pseudoaneurysm, I guess I'll prove to you that it's a pseudoaneurysm first. This is a conventional angiogram, and you can see this little ball of contrast that is uh, leaking out um, from the uh, axillary artery there. That's our pseudoaneurysm. Um, you can also note that there's no flow further on into the axillary artery and that there's large collateralization with the circumflex humeral arteries and with the uh, lateral thoracic artery there. So uh, there's pseudoaneurysm with arterial occlusion. 
Here is the MRI on the same patient. Uh, you can see that there is a large hematoma that is surrounding the axillary artery there. A lot of bright T2 signal, a lot of edema extending out into surrounding structures. This is right where we expect the brachial plexus to be running alongside the subclavian artery. You can see where this pseudoaneurysm, predominantly thrombosed pseudoaneurysm, uh, can affect those nerves. Venous thrombosis, uh, here's a T1-weighted sequence, and you can see there's no flow void in the subclavian vein. Sometimes you can see that just with slow flow, so be a little wary of that bright signal. MRI is not great at slow flow versus occlusion. This one is an occluded uh, subclavian vein, and you can see that on the T2-weighted sequences that not only the vein itself is bright, but there's a lot of inflammation surrounding it. Now, you might say to me, hey, wait a minute, there, it looks like there's a hematoma sitting right on the brachial plexus. Why isn't it just the hematoma? Usually, the reason you're getting venous thrombosis is from trauma. Often, there is a hematoma along with the uh, venous thrombosis. In this particular example, is it the hematoma? Is it the venous thrombosis? Uh, it's probably the hematoma, but uh, venous thrombosis in and of itself can cause uh, a brachial plexopathy. Let's talk about the concept of the thoracic outlet. The thoracic outlet is the gateway between the neck and the arm. We talk about the thoracic inlet that is the gateway from the neck into the chest, you know, running down behind the sternum, uh, across the sternal notch, down behind the sternum. That's the thoracic inlet. The thoracic outlet is more lateral. That's how you get from the neck out into the arm. And the brachial plexus and subclavian vessels are the canonical uh, anatomic objects that traverse the thoracic outlet. So uh, with that definition, what is thoracic outlet syndrome? Thoracic outlet syndrome is when the thoracic outlet is too tight. And um, you can get compression of vascular structures. You can get compression of nerve structures. Usually, the thoracic outlet gets compressed when the patient has particular eliciting maneuvers. And they don't have their symptoms when their arms are at rest, but for example, when they bring their, up arm, their arms up over their head, that's when they get their symptoms. They get tingling in their fingers. Uh, they get cold hands, depending on whether it's vessels or nerves that are getting pinched. So it's important to image the patient in the position that elicits their symptoms. What we try to do here from our protocols is do uh, one examination, one full examination of the brachial plexus with uh, arms down, natural position, uh, no symptoms, and then we tell them, put your arm in the position that, where you get the most symptoms. Patients don't like to do that, but it's really important to get them in a, a position and re-image them in that uh, position that elicits their symptoms. This is an example of venous compression in the thoracic outlet, venous thoracic outlet syndrome. This first image, these are both T1-weighted sagittal images, this first image is performed with the patient's arms in a neutral position. The arms are down at the side. You can see the subclavian vein. Here's the anterior scalene muscle, subclavian arm, uh, artery, uh, uh, nerves, the brachial plexus there. Here is the subclavian vein. It's got a normal size, no problem, right? Now let's ask the patient to put their arm up and re-image. When the patient puts their arm up, the clavicle comes back, compresses against the first, the, the first rib, and that poor vein is now compressed down into a tiny slit. And so there is uh, difficulty with uh, venous return, and the patient's arm will become cold. That is uh, uh, venous thoracic outlet syndrome. You can also image these patients in the coronal plane if you want to do MR venography. Um, this is a patient with their arms up in an eliciting position. You can see that there is a normal, maybe a small amount of narrowing of the subclavian vein on the unaffected side. But look at the subclavian vein on the uh, affected side. It's narrowed down to just a pencil line of flow. Remember that there's two types of thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, the veins or the nerves can be compressed. The usual spot of compression for the nerves is in the scalene triangle. So look at this T1-weighted image. The scalene triangle is right here. It's hard to make out the anatomy. You can see the anterior scalene muscle is bowed forward by pressure. 
the middle scalene muscle is right up next to it. There is almost no fat left in the scalene triangle. The subclavian artery is compressed anterior posterior and has an oval configuration instead of its usual round configuration. You can't even make out the trunks of the brachial plexus because there's no room for the fat in between them. So this is compression within the scalene triangle, and this is the nerve form of thoracic outlet syndrome. Let's conclude the lecture with a pop quiz, see if you've been paying attention. This is a CT, a contrastinant CT through the lower neck, and there's a mass right here, right? Um, but where is that mass and what is its relationship to the surrounding structures? That's really going to be key to our differential diagnosis. So is this thing in the scalene triangle? Is it in the uh, 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 in the anterior scalene muscle? Is it in front of the anterior scalene muscle, pushing the anterior scalene muscle back? It's really hard to tell here, but if we pull up a sagittal reformatted image, all of a sudden that anatomy we've been talking about this whole time comes into view. There's our anterior scalene muscle. Here's our middle and posterior scalene muscle. There's the subclavian artery, and we are running right through the subclavian triangle. This is a mass in the brachial plexus. It's a schwannoma of the brachial plexus. Sagittal images to the rescue once again. Now that concludes the lecture on old school imaging of the brachial plexus. Now you kids get off my lawn. <laughs>